All right, good morning, everyone. Good to see you all today. Um, the book of Lamentations is uh, probably not at the top of anyone's favorite book of the Bible list, uh, especially if you've read it. Um, it's uh, a book that's actually centered around events that happened during the summer of 587 B.C., okay? So um, um, before we get into that, I want to talk about times that we might remember. When I was growing up in the 80s, uh, there was a song by Brian Adams um, that was helping us all remember the summer of 69. Bought my first real six string, bought it at the five and dime, played it till my fingers bled. You guys remember this, right? That was the summer of 69. I wasn't even born then, and I'm in tune with the summer of 69. Um, I can, however, remember times and seasons of life and moments and days from my past. I can remember the fall of 2011. In this season of life, um, I started having these like paralyzing panic attacks uh, that I think was just related to probably lots of things, a midlife crisis and lots of other things, but there were doubts. I was questioning my faith, but um, it kind of like reframed everything I understood about my relationship with God. It was a real defining period of life for me. I remember September 11th, 2001, as I'm sure many of you do as well, uh, the day the World Trade Center was attacked. I was uh, sitting in my basement looking at my computer, and uh, I had this AOL homepage up on the screen, and I saw these images of those towers and airplanes that had run into them, and um, there was a significant moment that I remember so much about. I remember December 24th, 1993. Um, that was the last night that we were with my grandma at her home on Christmas Eve uh, before she passed away early the next morning. And I remember October 3rd, 2018, and I'm sure I will remember that for the rest of my life. Um, and it wasn't that many months ago, but my mother passed away on that day. And um, I'm sure in the upcoming years, there will be a lot I remember about the beginning of October, those days and what I thought and experienced along with my family during that time. I'm sure we can all remember times and seasons and dates and moments. This is a part of the human experience. We're forced to enter into pain and suffering. Certain events have a powerful effect in helping us remember even things that we may not want to remember. The same is true for the summer of 587 B.C. It's one of those seasons engraved on the minds and the hearts of Israel. Uh, to date, it was the single worst thing that had ever happened in ancient Israel. This was the summer that Jerusalem fell and was plundered by the Babylonians. There was despair and hopelessness and devastation. Jerusalem had been destroyed and its inhabitants had been captured and taken away to live in a foreign land about 600 years before the coming of the Messiah. Hope for Israel was completely vanquished. We've learned that it happened because of the sin of the people of Israel and also not just their own sins, but the generational sins of the people because of their wandering and their worship of other gods and their insistence on not holding up their end of the God covenant they had agreed to. And now Judah and Jerusalem lied in complete ruins, devastated by war, and the people were devastated as they were captors of war. Listen to Psalm 37. This is written from the perspective of captivity on the banks of the rivers of Babylon. This is from the message translation. Alongside Babylon's rivers, we sat on the banks. We cried and cried, remembering the good old days in Zion. Alongside the quaking aspens, we stacked our unplayed harps. That's where our 
captors demanded songs, sarcastic and mocking. Sing us a happy Zion song. Oh, how could we ever sing God's song in this wasteland? If I ever forget your Jerusalem, let my fingers wither and fall off like leaves. Let my tongue swell and turn black. If I fail to remember you, if I fail, O oh dear Jerusalem, to honor you as my greatest. God, remember those Edomites. And remember the ruin of Jerusalem. That day they yelled out, wreck it, smash it to bits. And you Babylonians, ravagers, a reward to whoever gets back at you for all you have done to us. Yes, a reward to the one who grabs your babies and smashes their heads on the rocks. There's something about that that captures the injustice, the rage, the intensity of the pain that they feel to have been ruthlessly taken away from their country the land that God had handed to them, and then being forced to live as slaves and foreigners. I'm going to read to you the last chapter of Lamentations. Uh, you, can, you can turn there if you want to, but you, you really don't have to because there's probably nothing in it to remember necessarily. But there's something to feel in it. So listen, remember, Lord, what has happened to us. Look and see our disgrace. Our inheritance has been turned over to strangers, our homes to foreigners. We've become fatherless. Our mothers are widows. We must buy the water we drink. Our wood can only be had at a price. Those who pursue us are at our heels. We are weary and find no rest. We submitted to Egypt and Assyria to get enough bread. Our ancestors sin and are no more, and we bear their punishment. Slaves rule over us, and there's no one to free us from their hands. We get our bread at the risk of our lives because of the sword in the desert. Our skin is, is as hot as an oven, feverish from hunger. Women have been violated in Zion and virgins in the town of Judah. Princes have been hung up by their hands. Elders shown no respect. Young men toil at the millstones. Boys stagger under loads of wood. The elders are gone from the city gate. The young men have stopped their music. Joy is gone from our hearts. Our dancing is turned to mourning. The crown has fallen off our head. Woe to us, for we have sinned. Because of this, our hearts are faint. Because of these things, our eyes grow dim. For Mount Zion, which lies desolate, with jackals prowling around it, you, Lord, reign forever. Your throne endures from generation to generation. Why do you always forget us? Why do you forsake us so long? Restore to us yourself, Lord, that we may return. Renew our days as of old, unless you have utterly rejected us and are angry with us beyond measure. In the book of Lamentations, it just ends this way. In a minor key. It's an unfinished story, and it just stays the way that it has for the past 2,500 years since it was written. This past week, I was at a Bible study uh, that had started in the Avondale neighborhood on the south side. Everyone that comes to the study has been in prison. Um, has suffered from some past abuse from spouses or parents or siblings. Um, there's mental struggles in that group. Uh, life, I would say, has not been kind to this group of people. Three of those in the group have recently started following Christ. And several others came to know Christ many years ago. And... Um, this group, this group of people, it tells a, a true story of people in that neighborhood. We prayed at the end of the Bible study a couple weeks ago, as we often do, and a few people had prayer requests. Uh, they, most of their prayer requests are for their health. Um, 
and one of the members of the group was currently in the hospital, so we prayed for her, and uh, someone opened us up in prayer, and then we sat in silence for a minute, uh, two minutes, three minutes, maybe even four. Uh, no one was shuffling in their seats. No one was looking at their watches. No one was checking their phones. No one was thinking about the important places that they needed to be. Um, and, and I wasn't either. And usually I'm the one, if there's like a 10 second lull in a prayer time, I'm like getting antsy and wondering when is this going to stop. But we all just sat there in silence. And I got the sense that we, we could have sat there for half an hour like that. I think silence said best what needed to be said in that moment. This is a group of people who have been broken by their own sins and the sins of other people that have affected their lives in a deep way. And this is this is lament. A lament is an essential ingredient for helping human beings understand an important aspect of their relationship with God. The expression of grief and distress over things like regret or mourning or injustice or sin. Communicating our distress to God about what's wrong in our lives is an appropriate response to the evil that's in the world. And, and of course, it's much better than keeping it all bottled up. I have this friend that I took to a men's retreat that I went to this past weekend, and uh, we, were, we were talking about things from our past that, that um, are hard and difficult and, and affect our kind of present experience. And when we first asked this question, he said, I like to keep the past in the past. And though I think we would all like to do that, uh, even he had to admit later as we were discussing this, that often his past actually bleeds into his present when he doesn't want it to. This past semester at my church, which uh, I'm a pastor of on campus at Ball State, uh, we've been talking about lament. We've been going through the book of Lamentations, and uh, I think people are pretty sick of it. Uh, <laughs> but we've been going week after week into this idea and topic. The book of Lamentations is five separate poems. Each poem is a chapter. And the first four chapters are acrostic poems, meaning that the first letter of each verse starts with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So at least for the first four chapters, you know when it's going to end. And then the last chapter that we read together kind of descends into this chaotic, mourning, despair, questioning, and just leaves with the question... God, maybe, if you were, maybe you have just rejected us forever. For centuries, Jewish people have read the book of Lamentations on the ninth day of the month of Av in remembrance of a number of national tragedies that took place during that month in various years, including the destruction of the first and second temples. So they regularly remember to lament through reading the book of Lamentations, and they're lamenting what happened in 70 A.D. Maybe you've seen pictures of the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. And visitors to the wall have long followed the practice of praying at the wall and mourning at the wall and taking little slips of paper and writing their prayers on them and folding them up and sticking them between the cracks of the wall. 
the Jewish people have woven into their lament, or have woven lament even into the fabric of their everyday lives. Every year when they celebrate the Passover, they take what they call the bitter herbs and they place those in their mouths and it causes their eyes to tear up and their nose to start running. And they do that to remember the tears of the people of Israel when they were in Egypt under the burden of slavery. If you've ever seen a, a Uh, either a picture or a video of a Jewish wedding, they take a glass and they break it underfoot. And they do that to remind themselves of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. In Jewish homes, they leave a corner of of the house unpainted in order to remind themselves that their personal house should not be finished while the temple of Yahweh remains in ruins. So they take this historical narrative and it's not left in some abstract form, but they bring it into real life, their everyday lives, because they recognize that their lament is not finished. In churches, we're we're celebrating the season of Lent right now. But Lent is a time of self-reflection and repentance as we prepare for the message of the one who's overcome death and destruction, but we make ourselves remember the pain and the suffering and our own sin and our own struggles and the struggles of the world around us. We hate each other in this country. We hate each other about a wall. Some people defiant that this is an issue of national security, and other people defiant that this is a humanitarian crisis, and we hate each other so much that we can't even, we can't even talk to each other about it. How can it be that we can't even hear each other? Racial divides are strong in this country. And those divides have a long history based off an injustice and systemic racism that has been written into the founding and the operation of our country for years and years and years. And I know in the places where I am that divide runs deep, still. There's hunger in our country. There's hunger in our world. And there's plenty of food in the world. This is unjust, to say it mildly. I don't know about you, but I approach difficult things I approach suffering in my life. I approach difficult things happening in the world uh, with a mentality. If we can just get through the hard times and get back to the way things are supposed to be, everything will be better. Once we have victory, once we overcome hurdles, once we stop letting life get us down, once we make progress, once we have a positive attitude, or once we move forward, this is the way we're supposed to be. I think connecting with addicts and felons and people who are stuck in generational poverty. People, people that I've become friends with on the south side of Muncie over the last couple of years, I think it's helped me see how deeply embedded in kind of a narrative of life that I live about positivity and victory and things being good within Christianity, even into the way I live my life in faith. What happens when the families that we're born into don't allow for the easy overcoming of barriers and hurdles and obstacles? What happens when there's no one to bail us out? 
generations of poverty and felonies and drug abuse and poor health and being marginalized and struggling to get ahead and struggling to just pay bills. And one of my dear friends lives in a house with no electricity, no gas, no water. And he lives in a neighborhood with a lot of other people who live the exact same way right here in Muncie. Works 40 hours a week. His wages are garnished because of back child support that he owes. He looks for places to get free food. He wants to take a trip to visit his kids down in Texas. But he just can't get ahead even enough to buy a bus ticket. This is one of the areas for me that I think I've had to face how easy I've had it growing up. Being born into a white middle class family. And lament for me has actually been really helpful because it's helped me to tell the truth. To actually see the injustice of those who are ignored or passed over or marginalized or forced to live in a few forgotten little neighborhoods right here in our community. Those who are exploited. Those who despite what we may all believe about the way humans should be treated aren't really given a second chance. That is a truer story than the story I would like to believe. On campus at, the, at our church, we talked to, as we've been talking about lament, we've been talking about things like racial injustice and um, we invited some of the minority students that are part of our church uh, to tell us what it's like to be a minority student in our church. And I'll just tell you, they, they had some good things to say, but they had some actually really hard things to say, too. We've talked about economic injustice both in the world and in our specific community here. We talked about our own sin and repentance and the sin of ignoring the right things that we should do at times. And each week for the per first part of the semester, at the end of the service, we wrote laments on post-it notes and we put them in this little wall that we created. And uh, I have a jar full of some of them. There's a lot more of them than this. But these are hundreds of of prayers that people have written to God about the things that are hard, the things that, are, that cause pain, the things that not just feel sad, some of them personally affecting them and, personal, and also affecting the world around them. I want to read to you a few of those um, this morning. I'm terrified that I'll become as sad and as empty as some of the people in my family. Broken homes and fatherless children. I feel like I'm alone. The Syrian refugee crisis. My struggle with lust and pornography. People using religion as a way to hate other people feeling forgotten by old friends, all of the trash in our oceans, my weight, not being good enough, willful ignorance to the struggle of others around us, racism, my addiction that seems to hold me back from true freedom in Christ, sex trafficking. I feel like God has forgotten me Corruption in the church. 
all the disappointment and sadness that I've caused my family and the life that I threw away. If you had a piece of paper and an opportunity to write something on it, where is the hurt and the pain and the unresolved tension for you? We must seek to be the church that integrates the theology of suffering with the theology of celebration. We are comfortable with celebrating. But we are hesitant about suffering. And that's why we have to have things like a season of Lent. But we have to be careful not to move too quickly from lament. In our church, it's been good for us, but hard to face and then keep facing our lives and the things in our world that are painful. But lamentations helps us because the lament, it just just seems to go on and on. There's like three hopeful verses in the book of Lamentation right in the middle of the book, and that's it. When are we done with lament? When can we be finished with it? That's probably actually not a very good question because lament does not end until all suffering ends. But even in lament, even in the middle of it, God is there. Like in the book of Job, when, when everything was taken away from him, and uh, Job laments uh, chapter after chapter after chapter, and then he has these friends, and these friends have something to say, and his friends uh, say things to him, things that aren't very helpful and don't really help him have perspective, and he continues to lament, and they're trying to explain his suffering. He's trying to tell them his pain and to justify himself and then at the end of the book like a like a mighty crescendo God speaks and these are some of my most favorite passages in the Bible when God speaks at the end of the book of Job then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm and he said who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge Brace yourself like a man, and I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? And if you've read this before, you know this goes on and on for several chapters. And God doesn't ever answer any of Job's questions that he has. But there's a message in here for us that at the the end of lament, or in our lament, after we've said all that we can say, or while we're saying it, God is there. God is right there there. In Lamentations, Israel is personified by a woman who is walking out into the streets and crying out. And she's not asking for pity. She's not saying, woe is me. No one cares. I'm rejected. Instead, she's saying, see me. Look at me. This is the true story. The woman recognizes that it's because of Israel's sin and their mistreatment of the Lord. And she's not hiding the truth about their sin and their neglect, but she's telling the story of her pain and she believes that she is worthy of being heard. I spoke at the Muncie Mission recently, and this is a program for men who are uh, coming out of homelessness and addiction. And I talked about this woman in the street from
from the first chapter of the book of Lamentations and, and how she wasn't there to justify or to hide from her sin or to pretend or to blame others, but just, just to be honest about the truth of the state of Israel. And her belief that it was worth someone's time. It was worth someone's feelings and affection to, to hear her. And as I was sharing this, I noticed uh, there were tears that have formed in the eyes of a few of the guys because I know that they feel the same thing. Hear me. Would someone just see me? And this is why we lament. Because we can say to a God who sees, see me. See our struggle. See our pain. See what's broken. See what's unjust. And God sees. This also defines for us as followers of Jesus our mission to the world. Both that we see and that we present out to the world a message that God sees. He knows. He knows how difficult the struggle is. He knows the pain. It doesn't matter whether it's self-inflicted or inflicted by others. God God knows the pain because he's there. And that means a lot. Um, he loves. He accepts. He accepts us right where we're at. He knows us. He understands us. He understands our plight. He's gone before us. He himself has suffered. He died so that we could have peace. Peace. So in our lament, God is there. I'm not sure exactly what we were trying to do in our church when we went through the book of Lamentations, but um, whatever it was, I think it, I think it has helped us. Because it's helped us to tell the truth about some things even some things that have been going on in our own church. It's helped us tell the truth about some things that are going on in our community and in our world. When we pay attention to both our own lament and the lament of those around us, we are at a position to be able to communicate to the world around us that there is a God who sees. I want to pray and just ask that God would speak to us in the middle of our brokenness and our own struggles and then as we look around to the people that we touch lives with, on a daily basis that we could proclaim that message that God, God is there. Lord, we invite you to help us. We invite you to reveal yourself to us. We invite you to show yourself even in the uh, interactions and the conversations that we have with others. We invite you to open our eyes to the struggles and brokenness and pain of those around us, and we invite you to convince us, Lord, that you are there. Convince us so much, Lord, that it would be our pleasure 
our greatest desire to tell that story to a broken world around us who desperately needs to hear it. Help us be the church in this way. In Jesus' name, amen.